Good afternoon. My name is Jean-Pierre Lacroix and I'm president of Chicotin Lacroix. And we're hosting today's Design Lounge session with Mark Snyder, who is president of RSW. RSW is one of the leading agency search companies in the U.S. And they specialize in helping companies and corporations find the right marketing, advertising, social media agencies that fit their profile. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, JP. Appreciate you having me here. Well, it's good that they, so I understand they let you through the Canadian border. They did. Yeah, they let me, yes, come into Canada. I'm much appreciated. Good. So you're uh, located where? Uh, we're based in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and uh, we've got 30 folks that work for us uh, there, have been in business since 2005. Obviously, you've been around when the, the downturn happened. So have you seen a lot of changes happening? In the industry? Yeah, I mean, definitely consolidation of agencies. A lot of smaller agencies uh, simply couldn't sustain, you know, the downturn that they were faced with. Uh, on the marketer side, the corporate side, same thing, a lot of consolidation, um, you know, uh, fewer people doing, you know, more things within these companies. Um, which which opens up opportunities for some agencies because they've you know got to look outside to try and get some support. But definitely a challenging time. I mean, came on you know started the business in '05, three years before the recession, and um, and you know fortunately we weathered it pretty well. Uh, but uh, you know definitely um, you know the, the industry I think has really changed not just because of the recession, uh, but you know as I'm sure you know is is digital and social media have become more and more active in the space, uh, you know, that's kind of changed the dynamics of not only how marketers think about their business, but um, also uh, the landscape of the agency uh, marketplace as well. That's great. You know, we, we've definitely been privy and party to that experience of change. Um, you know, RFPs um, uh, could be defined as a dirty word. Uh, uh, we all fill them out, uh, sometimes grudgingly when there's 30 or 40 different companies competing for sure. that one, especially with the downturn in the economy, we're seeing a lot more competition. We're also seeing um, some great RFPs that uh, uh, minimize the amount of questions get, that get asked mm -hmm. and, and obviously clarity on how we present the proposal. We've also participated in a lot of RFPs that are, were extremely confusing, <laughs> uh, where we've gone through four or five rounds of addendum just because we were required more information, more accurate information. Sure. And so today's session is really about, you know, how do companies, uh, the issuer of RFPs, the strategic mm -hmm. sourcing groups sure. or the marketing groups, you know, how can they do a better job or provide greater definition in RFPs? And so, you know, what would be some of the insights you could share to our group uh, and to the audience companies who mm -hmm. are preparing these RFPs? Because my experience is that they're done grudgingly. It's a lot of work. Some of these RFPs are 100 pages, mm -hmm. um, half it in legalese and half it in content sure. for marketing. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the the simpler uh, companies can make RFPs um, the better, just principally, because uh, at the end of the day, the more complex they are, and the more, they, uh, the more agencies they invite into the process, um, the less likely they are to take the time to really uh, dig deep into the responses and, and frankly be able to effectively discriminate between different agencies. Um, I know uh, in the agency searches that we manage, we typically try and limit the number of agencies initially in an RFI phase to about seven to 10 and then narrow that down pretty quickly to about three agencies. So we try and do it on a much more controlled basis because frankly, even looking at seven to 10 RFI responses, not RFP responses, gets overwhelming and can get a little bit confusing um, uh, when you have so many different agencies to review. So I think what's key is uh, having the marketer do their homework up front, or if they bring on a search firm like like ours or any you know search consultant to help them, make sure they're doing a lot of the upfront homework to do the right kind of screening. Um, not just functionally, does the agency have the right set of credentials to meet the needs of the marketer, but also start asking questions early on about. 
uh, some of the, the challenges that the agency has faced and um, that might be similar to the challenges that you know you the marketer are facing um, in, in the you know in your business and and start to um, you know kind of carve out the agencies that that make the most sense earlier in the process before you get too far down the line and and you know are pushing out these massive RF, RFPs to large numbers of agencies. So when you look at the um you know, the insight I, I hear is, you know, have a pre-qualified group, so less is more. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, how do you get to, even before an RFI, of narrowing down that scope of having the insights to determine who you're going to select to be part of the process? Um, you know, it's uh, what I can tell you what we do is spend a good deal of time with the client, with the marketer, whomever, you know, is responsible in, in the uh the company for managing uh, the search or coordinating the search. And we, we define a scope of search. Um, I spend a good deal of time with the marketer, uh, trying to understand what their need states are, what sort of issues they've had with existing agencies, um, what you know, specific challenges they're trying to, to address. And if there are specific requirements in terms of what they want their new agency to look like, you know, what sort of experience base or uh, other qualifiers. Let's define those up front, have the client literally sign the scope of search document, and then begin the search process um, by working through those qualifiers and, and interviewing agencies um, uh, without the step of the RFI. So that, that precedes the RFI. And, helps you narrow it down and get to a group of agencies that you know meet certain functional criteria, which then allows you to start diving deeper with a fewer number of agencies when you move into the RFI and then ultimately into the RFP phase. So who, uh, when you look at our development of RFPs, uh, you know, it, yeah, so you've pre-qualified a group of individuals, you've sent an RFI, but who actually within your organization should own the RFP process? Is it strategic purchasing or marketing or what should the collaborative structure be to ensure that the process yeah. works? Um, it's a, that's a tough one because I know, you know, procurement or strategic sourcing is getting more and more involved in, in searches. and. Um, the challenge there is uh, oftentimes strategic sourcing uh, looks at a search with a very narrow you know, view. Uh, they're, they're motivated to try and you know, bring the agency in that is gonna cost their organization the least amount of money. Um, so if the sourcing group needs to be involved, um, I, I think if there can be good collaboration between the marketing folks and the sourcing group, and each of those individuals have some say or responsibility for the decision. Uh, you know, if sourcing has to be involved, I, th I think that's that's the best situation is where there's some shared responsibility. You know, ideally, it's you know either the marketing person or the chief operating officer or the you know chief executive officer that's driving the train in terms of ultimately deciding on which agency, particularly you know, in, in a situation like some of the business that you do where you get involved in more of the upfront strategy, you know, you're involved in helping them kind of define business models and direction they need to be taking. You know, those kinds of decisions really can't be made effectively, at least in my opinion, at the strategic sourcing level and, and possibly even at the marketing level. Um, I think it's got to hit at a higher level like a COO or CFO or, or chief executive officer in order to, uh, you know, evaluate the situation, you know, most appropriately. It's an interesting point, uh, um, old story. Um, we've been privy to uh, RFPs where there was an internal alignment. I remember last year doing a presentation, new business presentation, where we had been, you know, obviously narrowed down into uh, through the RFP of based on very specific criteria and needs by the organization. And it was interesting during our presentation, um, capabilities presentation, 
that there wasn't actually alignment within the company. Okay. That actually the needs had shifted since the RFP had been drafted or maybe not socialized effectively. And so when you look at RFPs, you know, are there some pitfalls that we need to watch over so that those situations don't occur? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a hard one because um, uh, I know just from personal experience, I, I try and define who the ultimate decision makers are. You know, the, the purpose of the scope of search document is to try and get the organization aligned in terms of what the needs are. Um, and you can establish, you know, all those expectations and check all those boxes all you want all day long. And sometimes situations like that are going to happen. But I, I think that, you know, doing the due diligence up front, making, you know, if you're, you're an agency and you're, you know, working with a client, just asking some of those tough questions up front, you know, how many are involved? Is the incumbent involved? Um, uh, you know, I think uh, just from an agency standpoint, it's important that uh, they, you know, agencies try and really understand what they're walking into um, before they get involved in an RFP or an RFI. When you think of RFPs, there are obviously a wide range of services that the RFP is seeking to source. Uh, it could be a new advertising agency mm -hmm. or a package design firm or a retail design firm. Mm -hmm. or it could be a social media strategy or a mobile strategy. Does the RFP process change depending on kind of the industry or the needs that that the company is looking for? Uh, it shouldn't. I think the process itself um, shouldn't change depending on the needs. I think where it should change is uh, it should change if the scope of the needs are different. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if, you know, if all I'm looking for, I mean, I've seen clients push RFPs out for small little project type work and turn the search process into this complicated, convoluted exercise for something that, you know, few agencies would really want to get involved in because of the, the size of the, the project. Um, but I think if, um, you know, depending, you know, different, certainly different areas of marketing are, have, are going to have different levels of complexity. Um, so if we're talking about a retail exercise where a company is looking for a firm like yours to come in um, versus, uh, you know, looking for a mobile ARR, I think, you know, there's, there's a difference in terms of scope of the kinds of things that a company should be exploring and the questions they should be asking. But I think from a process standpoint, in terms of the steps you take, I think you need to do the same level of due diligence. Um, you know, again, just the, the, the depth of, of what you're asking and what you're trying to get out of these agencies, I, I would see, you know, changing depending on, on what it is they're after. Is there uh, pending the type of RFP? It sounds like uh, the extent of that RFP document changes. In other words, if it's a half a billion dollars or half a million dollars worth of consulting work that's looked at or, mm -hmm. or marketing work that's looked at, that, that RFP document would change in size. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it, I think it's, it's partly driven by the scope of, of what the challenge is that the client is trying to address. Um, and certainly the size and, and, you know, the size of the opportunity that, you know, that they're looking to fulfill. Um, you know, certainly the bigger the opportunity, the more, maybe the more questions they want to probe to make sure that they're, you know, getting at the right set of issues for the investment that they're making um, in the business. But I, I would, you know, again, my counsel to our clients is to keep it simple, keep it focused on the issues. Don't ask, you know, extraneous questions that really at the end of the day, um, you know, you're going to gloss over and not pay much attention to when you start reading the RFP responses or the RFI responses. Um, we try and 
when we write RFIs or RFPs, uh, we try and zero in, you know, pretty heavily into issue-oriented questions and, and not so much, we want to understand functionally what has the agency done. Uh, we, we do that, you know, earlier in the process, mm -hmm. but we try and really keep ourselves or keep our clients focused on zeroing in on questions that at the end of the day are going to be important kind of benchmarks for deciding whether they've got the potential for a good long-term partnership with this agency. The, the other thing too that um, I would suggest clients explore given the changing nature of the industry is to dig a little bit deeply into kind of the agency's perception of the market, how it's changing, and what they view as the implications of that change for that client's business. Um, it not only could prove insightful and be helpful to the client, but it'll also um, kind of uh, open up a, a window into the, the mind of that agency and, and give that client the opportunity to kind of see how that agency thinks how they might approach some bigger business related issues, you know, in terms of marketplace changes. And, and so that might be the only place that might veer from, you know, kind of a, a core set of issues questions where, you know, you can kind of get a bigger picture, look at maybe the strategic thinking of the agency uh, related to issues, you know, beyond just the, the specific task at hand. RFPs are an interesting process. Uh, we're seeing the growth of online. I've just submitted last week uh, an e-RFP where mm. the entire submission was done online. I also hear about, uh, less prevalent now, but these bidding RFPs mm -hmm. where, where, where the, the parties can actually see the bids of their competitors. And that's mostly in the commodity side of the business, but uh, talk a little about those type of RFPs, are the efficient use of clients' times? Are they effective at of getting the right partner to the table? Um, I can't believe that they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm sure they're great at getting the lowest cost provider, but um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I have a really hard time seeing the value of having you know, one agency see what another agency is doing from a bidding standpoint, um, uh, or, or you know, th this is a human business that we're in, and at the end of the day, um, with marketer ranks thinning, marketers need agency partnerships, I think more than ever, they need a good, strong, strategic partner that can help them uh, carry part of the load. And, and sorting out uh, the effectiveness of agencies via electronic submissions and price uh, comparisons uh, completely dehumanizes an industry that I think is, you know, relies on kind of the human element and, and, and the partnership that, you know, makes relationships, um, you know, long lasting and successful. So Mark, You've uh, managed, uh, what, 10 or 20 a year, these uh, uh, client agency searches. Mm -hmm. What's, what are the horror stories? What are the worst ones you've seen? Without naming clients, just if you can paint a picture of, and what went wrong? What, what was it that happened that made it not constructive? The worst ones I've seen have been, you know, the, the 100 page RFPs that, um, you know, get <laughs> into, uh, uh, you know, every corner of, of an agency's business, again, that really at the end of the day provides, I think, a little value to, you know, what it is that that client is really trying to achieve and finding a new agency. So uh, I, I fortunately haven't seen too many of those. And and in the business that I manage, I, I will often lead the development of the RFPs or the RFIs so we can kind of, you know, keep the client a little bit under control and keep them focused on the things that uh, they, they need. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the bigger challenge is uh, probably more on the agency side and, and uh, you know, keeping agencies kind of focused on the things that 
they need to be responding to. I've, I've seen, I'll never forget one RF, uh, RFP question that came from a client who very specifically said to this agency and all the agencies they were evaluating, this one agency happened to be a client of ours, so I got some exposure to it, and it was, they, they were specifically asked to not go on and on in response to this question, and after about two pages of responding to this question, you know, they, they, uh, the agency, uh, they, I mean, they just, they carried on and on, and I had to point out to the agency that the client was very specific about not wanting a long response. So, so it's, I think, um, uh, you know, fortunately, I haven't seen too many really long RFP or RFI requests from clients. I knew that, you know, I know they do exist, and I, but fortunately, I haven't seen too many of those. And so great case studies, you know, great examples of, of RFPs have gone extremely well. What would they be like? We managed to search for uh, Jack in the Box. They were looking for new digital AOR. And, um, and, and you know, again, we early on really started diving down into issues uh, that were central to this client's business. Um, they were trying to... Uh, take what they had established in the Jack character offline um, and bring that personality online. Um, and the agency that they were working with in the digital space wasn't doing a very effective job of, of bringing that character to life. Um, and so the questions that we probed in the RFI and the RFP phase were very specific to trying to understand uh, similar situations where they had to, you know, build up the equity of a brand or carry the brand from, you know, one media platform to another. Um, they were also looking for agencies. I don't know how much you know about Jack in the Box. But, I do a lot. And they were also looking for an agency that um, uh, had experience in dealing with similar sort of, you know, quirky personalities for brands. And uh, so, it, you know, we found a good number of agencies, but at the end of the day, we're able to sort out those that, you know, met not just the functional criteria of, you know, great digital experience and great analytics, but also some of these less, um, I guess, uh, you know, less functional um, uh, characteristics about the agency and, and ultimately um, you know, agency out of Salt Lake City ended up winning the assignment and it was a you know very successful search client was very happy um, uh, but it was you know we focused on the things that again I think were central to what these guys were trying to achieve. You bring back uh, a thought here uh, um, when it comes to expertise and so very often you receive an RFP, mm -hmm. and uh, um, they put a lot of weight on the expertise uh, within the category. Is that a common trait? Uh, because I know that you've written in your your uh, your white papers that uh, that that is not a prerequisite for performance. And you want to talk a little bit about you know that criteria of expertise within that category? Yeah, it's um, it is. Uh it's a tough one, you know, um, because uh, as I think we know, you know, you, you as an agency don't necessarily have to have the experience in, you know, category A in order to effectively address an issue that they're dealing with. That's very similar to an issue you've dealt with in category B or C. Um, but we know that marketers and companies feel very uh, strongly, oftentimes, that they have a very special category and, and need agencies that have that specific experience. And, um, and so we do see it quite often, you know, where marketers are looking for agencies that have, you know, experience in that specific category. And it's, you know, it's hard to avoid. Um, I think it's just one of those things that, you know, will always be with us. Um, I, you know, we see it, and, and you may see it as well, in my former job, I worked for a research firm, and we did new product concept testing, and we did ad testing, and if we were brought in as a new product concept testing agency, 
it was extremely hard to convince them that we could also do advertising testing because they pigeonholed us. So the same principle, I think, you know, yeah. marketers or companies get in the mindset of my business is special and I need somebody that has that experience. Now that said, uh, I think there's some real value in having agencies that can bring a variety of different experiences to the table. You know, it, it, you can get a little myopic if all you do is turn to agencies that only know your category. I think there's a lot to be learned and gained from bringing an agency on board that has the right set of technical uh, skill sets, you know, in your case, understand retail or understand packaging or corporate uh, design, but um, can bring, you know, experiences from other categories. I think there's a tremendous amount of value in companies looking at agencies on that, that level. There's <laughs> this thing called spec work, speculative mm -hmm. uh, presentations. And, uh, and it's interesting, there are, they really are peace fall into two groups. I fall into groups uh, where the, the organization is making a decision based on a set, set of criteria that are fact-based. They are capabilities, experience, the people and the staff, which ultimately at the end of the day um, plays a pivotal role in, in because it's, as you mentioned, a relationship business. And then there's organizations uh, that believe that the only way they can make the right RFP decision is to have the agency submit creative ideas. And we don't participate in those uh, and haven't since the beginning because we believe um, that it takes a lot more work and insight to, to deliver a sound strategy. And you've got to do that with internal resources on the client side mm -hmm. to gain alignment. But are you seeing a growth of that? Are you seeing less of that? Are you seeing people gravitating more to the fact base? What's, what's your observation? Yeah, I, I unfortunately seeing more of that happen, um, and I think it's happening uh, in part because marketers, I, I believe, have more choices of agencies out there. I think they feel, I think the other contributing factor is I think there's a lot of risk in making a change of an agency, so they're attempting to try and mitigate risk. Um, the searches that we manage, uh, usually it's up to the agency to decide whether or not they want to carry something like that forward. And it isn't, frankly, always the agency that presents a speculative creative that wins the business. You know, at the end of the day, I, I tell um, our agency clients on, on the agency new business side of our world that <clears throat> they all basically do the same stuff. They all create creative, but at the end of the day, what separates out a great agency from a good agency is the thinking and the process, everything that goes in behind it from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think personally there's greater value in having an agency come in and laying down some smart thinking and showcasing how they might tackle the client's problem versus coming to the table and maybe missing on a creative execution, um, you know, because they really haven't thought through what the real strategic issue is, or they just simply don't have enough information because they haven't been selected by the client to help manage their business. You know, when you look at RFPs, what kind of tips and insights could you give our audience on uh, how to make it a more efficient process? One is, is minimize the number of participants uh, from the client side, okay? Um, you know, have, have one or two people that are, are guiding the process. Um, I think you, you get too many cooks involved in making decisions. Uh, it, it becomes real challenging. We were managing a search for Mercy Health in Michigan uh, looking for a new AOR and they literally had 10 people that were involved in the whole review process and and it, it worked fine but it, it definitely wasn't efficient. It took a long time to make decisions and and that carried into the relationship with the agency and they're, they're doing fine but it's a challenge. So I think if you can minimize the number of folks involved and again as I said earlier I think zeroing in on on the core set of questions 
that aren't, aren't going to just kind of um, define functionally the differences in what an agency does or doesn't do, but core set of questions that are going to begin to pick apart the thinking and um, you know strategic thinking that the agency can can bring to the table. I think the you know the creativity is is great and it's important, but creativity really cuts across lots of different levels and you know creativity can play itself out pretty in a pretty pronounced way in terms of the strategy that is is presented to a client. So I think as much as you can start understanding how an agency is going to creatively solve problems or how they have for other clients in the past, I think the sooner you can do that, the the more um, efficient I think the search process is going to be for you. Okay, well, uh, Mark, thank you very much. You know, as I, as I was mentioning at the beginning of the session, you know, growth is on everyone's mind on the agency side, and RFPs are now a process to keep that growth coming. And so some great insights, if we can obviously provide some guidance to clients on development of RFPs. Uh, I think everyone wins. Uh, they win because it's a much more efficient process, and the agencies win because they spend their time answering the right questions for the right reasons. And so thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're gonna leave the lines open uh, at uh, Design Lounge for the next 15 minutes. By all means, please uh, look at the bottom of your screen. There's a phone number there that uh, you can call in and Mark and myself will be available to answering any of your questions. And again, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.